Welcome back to my series of videos on Mathematics for Economists. In this video I'm going to talk about uh, another solution method for scalar ordinary differential equations. If you find yourself in a situation where your differential equation is given such that it can be factored, uh, as I wrote it here, uh, that it can be factored into the product of a function that depends only on time and a function that depends only on the state. Or in general, if your ODE depends on, um, uh, on two variables, t and x, that you can separate the differential equation on the right-hand side into two factors that respectively only depend on one of the two variables. Equations like this are called separable, and there's a relatively straightforward way to solve them. Because if we um, consider uh, an antiderivative of 1 over h of x, and we consider an antiderivative of g, if they exist, then we can write x dot, which is the derivative of x with respect to t, uh, of course, as g of t times h of x. Here I'm just repeating the, the separable equation. Then I can divide through by, by h, so I get 1 over h of x dx dt equals g of t. And now I can integrate with respect to t. And I get the integral over 1 over h of x dx dt with respect to t on the left hand side. On the right hand side, I get the integral of g with respect to t. And this amounts to, since on the left hand side we're left with the integral over 1 over h with respect to x, this amounts to the relation h of x, the antiderivative of 1 over h, is g of t, the derivative of little g, plus a constant. And now we need to be lucky that we can, in a tractable fashion, invert the mapping h and evaluate the inverse function h in capital G of t plus c, and then we have our solution. Yeah. It's very simple. Uh, best learned by a concrete example. So let's say that we have the differential equation x dot is x of t square. And we have an initial condition that in zero we need to go through a given value x naught. Um, then uh, h of x is x squared, so uh, capital H of x, antiderivative of 1 over little h, is minus 1 over x, right? because h prime then is 1 over x squared, which would be 1 over little h. And g of t is the silent 1 that is standing there, that's very easy. So capital G of t, therefore, is just t. Now, separation of variables says capital H of x equals capital G of t plus c. So minus 1 over x is t plus c. So x is minus 1 over t plus c course only for values of t which are not equal to minus c, otherwise we have a problem. Um, in 
point in time zero, we get minus one over c. This needs to be equal to x naught, and therefore we get that c is equal to minus one over x naught. And thus we can write our solution for x that satisfies the initial condition as minus one over t minus one over x naught, or if you're so inclined, minus x naught over x naught times t minus one. No? Another example, uh, let x dot be given by square root of x divided by t for t bigger than 1 and we have an initial condition in point in time 1 which is some given value x1. Then we can separate h of x is x to the 1 half square root of t looks a bit like times 1 half, I mean to the power of 1 half. Uh, so capital H of x, antiderivative of 1 over little h, is 2x to the 1 half, because then h prime is x to the minus 1 half, which would be 1 over little h. Um, g of t in the separable equation is 1 over t. And thus, capital G of t, the antiderivative of little g, is a log of t. Separability says capital H of x is equal to capital G of t plus a constant. And so we get that 2x to the 1 half equals log t plus constant. Or, yeah, so in these cases we're uh, always lucky that we can easily find the inverse mapping to capital A, capital H. Yeah? So we do this here. Um, if we isolate x on the left-hand side, that is, we get log t plus constant divided by 2 and the whole thing squared. We're supposed to satisfy an initial condition. So we need to evaluate our expression in 1, log of 1 is 0, so we get c half squared, which of course is c squared divided by 4. This must equal x1, and so we get that c is given by 2 times square root of x1. And so we can gather our solution that satisfies the initial condition as log t plus 2 times square root of x1 divided by 2 and the whole fraction squared. Yeah? Easy examples. Let's look at a more slightly more involved and also more economic example. Let u of x be a twice differentiable utility function. And x here is some consumption level. Then we can look at the elasticity of u prime, the first derivative of u, with respect to x. This would be by the definition of elasticity, the differential of u prime in relation to the level of u prime differential of x in relation to x itself, which, of course, can be understood as, well, 
the derivative of u prime with respect to x times the level of x divided by the level of u prime. So this would be uh, u double prime of x times x, second derivative, um, divided by the first derivative. But we can, of course, also understand it as the d log of u prime of x divided by d log x. The negative of this elasticity minus u double prime of x times x divided by u prime of x is called the arrow Pratt measure of relative risk aversion. What's the idea here? The basic idea is if we if we plot cartoonistically a utility function x u of x. And so let's let's look at a few different possible utility functions. U1, U2, U3. Uh, these are risk averse utility functions because um, they have uh, uh, they have negative curvature. So the the um, as x increases, the derivative u prime decreases. So in other words, if we increase our consumption level f our marginal increase in utility is actually decreasing. Um, so this are, these are risk-averse utility functions. So risk-averse because um, large decreases are large decreases in, in um, and the consumption level are more avoided and large increases in the consumption level are less welcome because they're still welcome but less welcome than with uh, uh, less risk averse utility function so u3 here would be the most averse uh, risk, most risk averse utility function uh, u1 would be the least risk averse utility function a linear utility function is risk neutral and then uh, risk uh, utility functions that are upward that have that have positive curvature so are um, uh, uh, are uh, are convex. Uh, they are actually risk loving. But let's stick with risk averse utility functions. Um, then we can make our the motive. We can give a motivation of this arrow Pratt measure. Um, so if we if we now plot also just as cartoonistically the uh, the derivative of the utility function, um, then we see. Well, the, the slope is everywhere positive, but uh, uh, the slope decreases. So the um, the typical shape for a risk averse utility function would be something like this. So this uh, expresses the idea of decreasing marginal utility. Yeah, and then if we now also want to draw the second derivative then since now the slope of the first derivative is everywhere negative I actually drew my coordinate system incorrectly I need the negative uh, half space here since the uh, slope is everywhere negative um, and is, uh, is uh, largest for uh, for small values of uh, uh, of x, I would uh, as absolutely largest for small values of x, I would get something like like this shape. And this means that u double prime, the second derivative, is negative. And so, in our arrow Pratt measure, uh, we would the, if we if we just consider the fraction itself, 
um, we always have uh, for, for positive x, positive consumptions level, which we assume, uh, we would always have a negative number standing here. So we take the negative to have a, a positive measure of risk aversion. And the, the larger the, this positive measure of risk aversion, the more negative um, you double prime is and the, the, the stronger the curvature and larger curvature means that the, 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 the more we get here into this uh, uh, highly risk averse um, family of utility functions. Yeah? So that's kind of the uh, motivation behind the definition of the, um, of the arrow Pratt measure. What does this all have to do with separability? Well, let's uh, just as um, uh, uh, in the in the example in uh, in variation of constants with the uh, with the hazard rate, let's assume a specific functional form for con for the for the relative risk aversion measure, right? So if we say that we have um, constant relative risk aversion. which is abbreviated sometimes CRRA, sometimes just CRR. Um, this would then uh, uh, require that the utility function satisfies this equation. And theta is just a positive constant. So if we uh, rewrite this, we can say that the second derivative of u must satisfy minus theta over x times u prime of x. And now we're in a situation where we can actually substitute. So substitute and call u prime v. Then v prime of x is minus theta over x v of x. And this is a perfectly uh, separable first order differential equation. So we can write it as the product of a function g of x, which would be minus theta over x, and a function h of x v, which would be just v itself. So, um, so in this application of separability, uh, x takes the role of t, yeah, and v takes the role of x in the development of our uh, separation formula. So what we need to find is capital H of V, the antiderivative of 1 over little h of V. And little h of V is just V. So we need the antiderivative of 1 over V. Well, that's easy. So H of V is the log of V. Then we need G of X. This is the antiderivative of little g of x, which is minus theta over x, well, that's also only marginally more difficult. So g of x is minus theta times the logarithm of x. And then I can apply um, separability. So separability says capital H of v equals capital G of x plus a constant. Let me call this constant C tilde for the time being. So we plug in log of v is minus theta uh, log of x plus a c. Uh, so I have now uh, introduced a new constant c and the relation is that c tilde is minus theta times c. Huh? Uh, but that I'm certainly free to do this to call to just scale my constant here uh, by minus theta. Then I can plug both sides into the exponential function. I get v of x is uh, x to the minus theta 
and then e to the minus theta times c. And that I can call coefficient c naught x to the minus theta, yeah? where the coefficient c naught is, is exactly this e to the minus theta c. Then u of x is the integral over u prime of x with respect to x, of course, is the integral over v of x with respect to x, which was our substitution, is the integral over c naught x to the minus theta dx. Okay, so I can distinguish, I have to distinguish two cases. Um, theta equal to 1, where I have c over x, and theta not equal to 1, um, where I get a different antiderivative. So let's start with the, with the case theta not equal to 1 first. So c naught is just uh, a coefficient, and then I get x to the 1 minus theta divided by 1 minus theta as the antiderivative. Uh, or the, the evaluated integral here, plus a second constant c1. This would be for the case theta is not equal to 1. And then if theta is equal to 1, I'm of course just uh, evaluating the integral c0 outside times the integral of 1 over x, and that's just c0 times log of x. So in that case I have log utility plus a different uh, constant here. And this is in the case of theta equal to 1. So this is the family of CRRA, constant relative risk reversion utility functions. And we see that we, we can derive them as the solution to a differential equation that comes out of requiring that relative risk aversion, as expressed by this arrow Pratt measure, is constant. This gives us a um, this gives us a separable um, first-order ordinary differential equation, which we can then solve to give us the specific functional form of the solution. And note that this is one of the cases where the indicator variable of our um, of our desired function is not time, but is actually the consumption level here. But we can also apply um, our our theory to those kind of cases. It's just that most often we are interested in cases where uh, our functions move through time, but not here. So um, thank you very much for watching.